Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'll get started. I think a few colleagues are still joining us. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, from wherever you're joining us. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Julio, and I work on uh, innovation at UNDP. Uh, and uh, today we are particularly excited to have two people who are no strangers to UNDP, have crossed our paths before in many different forms and shapes. Um, but uh, the reason why we're particularly excited about this particular session is that we've been on a journey for a, a while now to actually think through what it means to provide uh, new options to decision makers uh, who are tackling really complex issues and uh, allow them to uh, not feel trapped or uh, obliged stuck with a very limited number of solutions and options at their disposal, but actually being able to uh, explore and expand uh, the possibilities in their hands as they are dealing with really difficult issues. And one of the uh, reasons we think why uh, it is very difficult to create political space to explore different options is that uh, it's difficult, A, to say, I don't know. Uh, it may be difficult to actually uh, just open up a space for topics that may be quite difficult to explore otherwise. Uh, but also it may be just, in some cases, uh, simply a lack of uh, imagination or possibility of stretching the imagination to think of what is actually possible. Um, so it is in this context that we are exploring uh, different approaches and opportunities, methods, uh, to actually uh, create this space uh, to think about new possibilities, to explore different options, and particularly when it comes to a topic like economic models, uh, where there seems to be a certain orthodoxy that is quite difficult to uh, challenge in many different ways. Uh, how can we actually bring new tools and explore new approaches to create a different dialogue around this topic? So we are uh, extremely pleased to have uh, today with us Nadia and uh, Yuda who are going to uh, solve all of our problems. Um, uh, or, and uh, tell us how can we actually uh, do this. Uh, and they do so coming from a very particular experience of uh, setting up and working on the Sci-Fi Economic Lab. They're going to tell us everything about it in a moment. And the specific tools that they draw from and approaches that they draw from, from the world of um, science fiction to actually uh, help uh, open up possibilities and rediscover imaginations. Um, so uh, I am certainly very much looking forward to this session and uh, Nadia and Judah, over to you. Super, thank you, uh, Julia. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us. Nice to see you here. Um, so, uh, I can say a little bit about what um, what the world building uh, actually looks like through some some examples, like real life examples of what can be done with it, and then we'll move into actually looking at how how the world building takes place. Uh, does that work? Yeah. Okay. So um, a really good example is how Costa Rica interpreted the, the call for sustainable development in, in the 80s. So most places interpreted in the form of minor tweaks and greenwashing exercises, but Costa Rica went a lot, a lot further. So they redesigned their whole economy around eco-tourism and today, well, prior to COVID, <laughs> the services now account for around 80% of the country's GDP. And so what they've done is they've aligned their economic interests with the protection and enhancement of the natural environment. And so things that um, we could look at within the context of world building would be things like reversing deforestation 
or extensive pricing of pollution or abolishing the military like they did. Um, and another example is in Estonia. So in the 2000s, if you recall, e-government really, really became a thing in the mainstream. So in most countries, um, the way this was interpreted is uh, bringing online uh, public some some public services, but Estonia went really really far. They started out with a fully functioning, usable digital identity, and they used that as the key to access not only government services but private ones like banking. And then they moved on to redesign the services themselves um, in in, an, in a way that um, that a, a an optimized single uh, rational data architecture allows you to. So you could opt into a service where the, the government would calculate your taxes um, based on um, what was happening in your bank account. And so now the step further is rethinking statehood itself, the state in a digital era with elements like um, digital residency. So um, you could be uh, uh, you could be resident in a different country, but you could access Estonian cloud services, set up a business, access a single market, and so on. And so uh, he, these are these are two examples of <laughs> where people have stepped outside the norm of what is considered possible and it it really took rethinking things fun fundamentally um, and what we're looking at with uh, the world B building academy is a structured process for making that kind of thinking uh, um, more likely but then also playing out the possible uh, the possible consequences um, political implications, uh, what might block or enable the, the ability to actually deploy this on the ground. And so, um, Yuda, maybe you can go a little bit into the, the, the actual world building exercise and, and how it functions. Sure, sure. So let me um, give a sort of the necessary amount of information about Witness first. Some of you may already know this. Um, Witness is explicitly a world designed to understand what economies and what kinds of social contracts are most suitable or rather most resilient in the face of climate change, in the face of market collapse, in the face of large externalities. And to understand, to sort of create a fictional world where the economies are balanced, where production and, uh, and production and consumption, and all of these systems that actually make up most of the lives of the lives that we live, exist, and then to throw massive events at it and to see how these systems might respond, and that response then forms the political history of said area. So. This is essentially a process. Now I'm going to sort of lapse into science fiction author speak. Um, so let me know if some of the terminology passes you by or, requ or requires more clarification. So the first step is, of course, the first step towards creating a future goes without saying is to first imagine it. If you can't imagine it, then there's nothing to move forward to except by the Brownian motion of civilization. So the process of imagining it, imagining a future or a world is sometimes a, a such a broad task that when we say futures, or rather to me, when a lot of people say, oh, we are imagining futures, it sounds incredibly vague and I immediately go, okay, so what? What exactly is this about? So, so what we've done here is take tools from the world of science fiction. I'm a science fiction writer to take tools that authors use to construct living, breathing worlds that capture imaginations and then deploy that in service of answering these questions. What does a plausible future look like? What does a given initial starting conditions? What might a future look like? And how do we get there from A to point A to point B? So the first step um, 
is to create what we think of as a high level archetype Act, uh, and this high level archetype has very specific uh, requirements firstly we need to decide what information we privilege and by that i mean what systems are most important to us in the design of this world nobody's god so you cannot create a world that is perfectly rendered right down to the last molecules and every law of physics and so on so we have to make trade offs the first and the first thing we do is decide what is the most important part of this world or this future that we're going to create is it the economy is that what we want to focus on do we want, or do we want to focus on education do we want to focus on religion do we, what aspect of society what aspect of human society are we putting most of our attention to what foot do we put forward first so once that's done within that lens we create a high level archetype in witness for example it was always the economy first and in that service the initial prototype called for five cities that had completely different economic systems you have the classic uh, sort of high very high kian very libertarian system going on there there was another that was a implementation of almost republic and almost republican uh, and almost roman republican style oligarchic society that had decayed over time there was another that uh, that there was another that had started as an experiment in anarchism and had then slowly reconciled itself through having to face issues like agricultural self sufficiency and so on and these were drawn from real life these are drawn from uh, marina leda in spain messina in italy the corp uh, the corp economies of vietnam for example uh, the punk movement to see strains of movements and belief systems and existing sort of pseudo visions of the future in real life that take them and accelerate them and that forms the archetype and the first layer of fleshing out that we did in the context of witness uh, i believe project link has been shared is to then decide okay how do we express this we in witness we decided to express it as a wiki because it was quite a natural form because we're dealing with text and we also want to engage so many people and public imaginations to have economists ethnographers philosophers all jumping in to analyze weaknesses of the systems and a wiki was quite a natural form and edge riders the platform itself is extraordinarily capable of this this sort of uh, work once that archetype was written down we started to resolve what we call fuzziness okay what does uh, what does an economy that intentionally sacrifices gdp in exchange for a higher quality uh, a uniformly higher quality of life for uh, the the poor look like what what does that actually manifest as what kind of political decisions have to be made what kind of social contract does such a future require so then we would look through theory and we would look through uh, systems and start bringing these in resolving the fuzziness then we kept uh, sort of we keep on increasing sort of the level of detail in the in the economic system because that was what this future was centered around and then once the economy was was nailed down by this time the archetype had obviously been exceeded it had gone from uh, we had started out with five different districts it had gone to 12 different possible futures and uh, 12 different possible highly resilient economies that were being modeled and then we started looking we took another leaf from the science fiction textbook and started looking at right what is required to communicate this to people in a manner that excites their imagination in a manner that gives them material so that the imaginations can actually engage and go i can see myself living here i can tell myself the story i can see myself being a business person here being a citizen haggling in a market here being a, a policy maker here so that is where we draw from this thing called the cultural iceberg the cultural iceberg is a concept that we often find in sociology but it's also very useful in world building you see when we create a story as authors when we tell a story suppose i were to bring out the example of you reading a story that i've written where you the or the, the main character goes through a market 
and sees two people that they've never seen before haggling in a strange language over the price of something. If that is what you see. You see the market. You see the wind. You you hear the wind. You see the sky above. You see the color of uh, of the window stalls. You see the texture of the clothing of the two people that you have just seen. Underneath it, the author is thinking, "What is the purpose of this market? What's it doing here? Who are these two people? If they're haggling, there has to be a lingua franca. There has to be a common tongue of trade. What is that common tongue? Is that the language that you the the uh, as part of as the character is that the language that you are used to speaking is that why they're having the market here where have these strangers come from what are they they trading um because it has to be something of mutual value to to the societies that they come from so questions like these um the cultural iceberg asks us to think about different facets of culture that that show in societies around us and make them human and basically inform us about people's attitudes their languages uh cultural aspects that we see for example taboos how they uh, how the, you know behavior in uh, behavior towards your family elders uh, younger citizens non citizens all of these things that go into making into taking this rather dry theoretical economic vision and bringing that to life in a manner where someone can read it and imagine themselves visiting this location so then we have then once that's done that yields uh, uh, and almost think of a think of it as a wiki page of an alternate future where there's an economy there's this 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 vivid physical descriptions of what it could be based on uh, based on quite often on reality and now comes the question of okay how did this get here and we look back at what are the starting conditions of a system this uh, let's say for example that we have uh, a perfect um, an absolutely perfect uh, socialist economy running that where hoarding wealth is impossible where most of it most of the wealth in the economy is actually recycled back into services for people then we have to ask ourselves fine this this future looks fantastic it looks cool it is stuff of science it's literally the stuff of science fiction how do we go there from here how do we go there from what we assume our starting conditions are to be what political decisions have to be made if and then we start imagining agents making these political decisions policy makers events that come into place and also reactions now to these political decisions based on the based on those starting conditions based on the people who already exist there because nothing ever no utopia form is is fully formed out of a vacuum there is always dissent there struggle and this process of describing uh, an event or a uh, or policy makers actions that bring about a certain set of conditions the reactions to it the reactions to that and this process this rather chaotic process creates a political history that lets us imagine how we might go from this starting condition to this future now is it perfectly representative of what might actually happen no no that's predicting the future right down to a t is an impossible task and anyone who says that they can is either a super forecaster or completely mad but the idea is that you capture the chaos of different factions uh, that will affect policies to take us from this place a to this place b that generates down now that adds a political history to this future that we have created it creates a link to the past then we then we go to stage 2 which is what we call tightening the screws and that's why we start asking ourselves very specific questions what does the life of an average citizen look like in this world what does the life of uh, of someone who is a, who is in a position of privilege and power look like in this world what does the life of someone who is marginalized look like in this world what does marginalization look like what happens to people at the edges who are not possibly content with these kinds of systems and we add in the process of now we have created a world there are constraints within it and we know that if we do this task of 
modeling these agents, these ordinary citizens, these extraordinary citizens, citizens at the ages, you can see how people might react to this type of system. And if you to make it even more accurate, you can bring on people, in our case, for example, we asked ourselves, well, how would, what would an economist look like in one of these worlds? And we have economists. And so they were readily able to imagine the kind of roles and the kind of actions that they might take and the satisfaction or dissatisfaction that they might have if such a system existed, if they were living within that. If it's, if it's for example, a specific type of activism, what would these activists protest against? What would, what would they be happy with? what would the lives of what new forms of uh, activism or what new forms of movement are required in this and you bring on people whose life experiences have given them that sort of thinking and that sort of pull and that cause to actually now step in and imagine themselves in this future and so the, and that's one layer of tightening the screws and then we ask ourselves, so now we have profiles of people who might live in this, right? We can now readily imagine ourselves living inside this. And it is a vision that is not just a very theoretical example. It's a vision that can be read by anyone. It's, it's a vision that people can actually engage in without necessarily needing to understand the fine grained details of this beautiful modern Monterey theory thing put in here or how this implementation of the mission economy works people of all different stripes can see themselves in this world and they can and they contribute to it and in the contributions and in the argument and in the tensions the world begins to come alive for example uh, and we have we have seen this debate happening and this is an example that i'm actually bringing out someone who is um, someone who is an economist might say well this system has some inefficiencies maybe we should bring in, we should start thinking of mission economies. And someone who's an activist would stand up and say, no, because you know what? I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to work. I don't, uh, you're going to have protests, you're going to have riots, and I'm saying this based on my experience. And the clash between them now keeps adding to the history and the richness of the world that you've created. And then once you have the platform, of people, once you have this world, you can imagine people in this world now we start imagining what happens if X adverse events happen. And by X adverse events, I mean things that we are interested in avoiding. Because if anything, if we have seen anything from the recent crisis, from the 2008-2009 economic crisis, from what happens with COVID, the world keeps throwing all sorts of rather interesting externalities at us that many of our economies and our assumptions, particularly when those are based on rational agent theory, are simply not qualified to handle. We start now imagining how this world and the people within it, the people who are now imagining themselves in it, can react to things like market failure, drastic, drastic uh, climate change events, um, some like breakdowns in logistics, civil wars, political, massive political rivalries breaking down or political systems grinding to a halt and bureaucracies essentially ceasing to function. How would these people recover? How would they respond or will this vision of the, can this vision of the future actually stand up to these things? So this is a process of essentially creating a world, populating it with people, and then actually simulating events inside it in the form of the back and forth of conversation and in the form of narrative to better understand, not just to tell stories, we want to understand where this vision of the future breaks. And when it breaks, we return back to an earlier process and go, right, this is what we need to fix, run through the same process. So think of a program looping itself, looping back into specific parts of itself until it compiles without fault. That's sort of the process that, that happens here. Once that is done, once that tightening of the screws is done, you essentially have something that serves as a source, almost a dictionary of, of, I hate to call it dictionary of visions, but that's what it is. It's a world that contains slices of life that you can take, a, that you can take from for any type of message. It may be as simple as, now in our case, witness is largely geared towards encouraging economic thinking and drawing people who really want to think about new economies and 
that's what it's geared towards. That's what the narratives are geared towards. There are philosophy, entire new philosophies in there that we have invented using things like ergodosity economics and fact and Talib, Talib distributions that have drawn economists to think about them in new ways. But say you were to gear this towards policymakers, what kind of stories can a policymaker take from this? What kind of messages can a policymaker take from this? What are they interested in? Uh, what would a journalist be interested in? What stories can you actually pull out from this and use to describe the kind of future that you, that you want to get to? And that's what this sort of repository of visions contains. And once you have those stories, now naturally you have the causal links back to the starting condition, which is whichever place or fictional city or real city or real life region that we are starting from, you have the causal link to go where exactly, okay, how do we get there from there? What kinds of policy changes need to happen? What do we need to push for? And these narratives come forth. So that is sort of um, the, I would say a very, High, not a very high level perspective of how the process works. Repeated iterations starting from this large prototype and slowly filling in the causal links, the profiles of people and how, and then trying to simulate how this system reacts to adverse conditions. Yeah, Nadia. I think we're starting to get some some questions that are coming in. Yeah. Uh, so how many participants are there currently imagining a witness? That's a good question. It started Alberto, with, maybe uh, I think maybe Alberto has like the fresh numbers, no? Yeah. Um, we have I know we have at some point we have had uh, two hundred odd people who have contributed ideas to it in the form of public webinars. We, uh, we know we have somewhere between 12 and 20 people who have then taken those ideas, added stuff of their own and actually started adding things to it. But this is rather, this is rather interesting. Is there any external check on the imagining to see if the contributions are factually accurate? There is, and that's in the form of the team itself as in the co-contributors the co themselves we constantly check and in fact it's not just a process of someone sitting there reviewing entries but it's a process of everybody by dint of interest being able to pick apart new contributions and go well maybe this economy is, is not the math doesn't work out or maybe this type of infrastructure is completely redundant given that we have power infrastructure in this other region There's a number of other questions on you, the, both in the chat yes. and in the Q&A. Yes, yes, and in the Q&A as well. Manufacturing companies are already using twin technology to create a similar crime scenario in a computer. Yes, um, in, some, in some regions, particularly in telecom, in the intersection of telecom big data, this is called the digital twin. It is, it is. However, it is not a twin of a system that exists today. It is a twin of a, it is, I would say, an idealized system. The goal is not just to recreate what already exists in IMAT, you know, because there's no point using imagination to create what already exists. The point is to imagine as comprehensively as possible what could exist and then to look back at what already exists and fill in the gaps of how this one system can transition to the other. The complexity and variables in economics are many. So when backcasting, how do you create boundaries to these variables? Are there any tools and criteria to help? That's a very good question. There is, there, in, econo in, sort of, in economics, there is um, specific to a type of economy that you, that you wish to implement. There are, so there are boundary conditions, but there is no one size fits all rule here because it depends very it depends very drastically. Um, for example, I'll give an example of one of one rather interesting economy that we have, which is two rather two interesting economies that we have. One is 
uh, a very uh, anarchic communitarian economy that started out with sort of very punk vibes and then ran in, ran headlong into problems of agricultural and energy self-sufficiency and had to solve these and had to think of microgrids and infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that economy has in place is a blockchain implementation of a currency, which unlike what we have now, the, the weird stuff that we have going on, which is wasting trees and killing polar bears right now, that particular implementation is there to ensure that you can't hold it. It takes the form of wallet that is given to everyone the moment they walk into its boundaries. This wallet can only be filled up to a certain amount. You can only have a certain amount of money of currency at any given moment. Uh, if you earn more than that, it is simply wasted and redistributed to the rest of the system. If you have less, it slowly ticks up and it slowly refills towards an average. And that stems from this system's distrust of centralized banking and the system's distrust of centralized policy, which, uh, which is playing on a theme of techno-libertarianism we see today. Um, so the, the conditions for that and the, and the variables for such a thing existing are drastically different from the other economy, which is a church-based. It's actually a very religious uh, scholastic community. It was pointed out by Alberto, who is uh, a chief economist of witness, um, that uh, that sort of Benedictine worker economies of the Middle Ages were actually capable of conceiving and conceptualizing and implementing projects that took generations to implement. For example, you might lay down the foundation stone, your grandson's grandson might be the person putting in the pane of glass for that church, and that monument would last 100 to 200 years. And it's this kind of long-term thinking that market top, just markets and short-term optimization simply cannot seem to handle. And again, the variables are completely different. Boundaries are completely different. It goes by, the, and that's where domain expertise is critical in stress testing these things. And that's part of the, the, the sort of stress testing the archetype and making sure that works. That's part of the tightening the screws process. Um, so if I can add something, this uh, Terence and, and Ali, I think one of the one of the differentiators of of this kind of collaborative, speculative uh, world building is um, that it's it's useful for coalition building as well. And, and negotiating, uh, negotiating around possible past to the future in a kind of low risk setting, because it's in those in those exchanges, in the pulling apart, in um, deepening, richening, answering questions, and so on. You start to have a a kind of consensus building or or debate. Um, between very different people and, and different interests. And so it's really designed for emergence. We don't have to have all the pieces in place. And it it can, you know, you can have very different carrier vehicles or entry points to participation in the process. In some cases, like we're discussing with this one island they want to do a, a festival um, because they want to uh they have this concept of being like the barefoot singapore and this is like a very broad abstract vision but what does this actually mean so they want to do uh, a festival others want to do a massive uh massive game like a a, a serious game Others will have different entry points and you can engage the people that you, you need to be in the process. Yeah, which is, which is why we sort of say there is no specific framework in particular because the actual framework relies so much on, on bringing people to the table who represent these different interests. And through that back and forth, that is the world that is the world that emerges and it's more honest than having like a 12-step process of saying right let's build the roads here power stations here this here and uh, just constructing like a templated vision of the future 
these are the interesting question. Can you clarify if you want wild sci-fi stories or well thought out alternative economic systems? Wild sci-fi stories are called fantasy. Uh, we're not in fantasy territory. Um, good science fiction is what we are after here. And of that, the bulk of the focus is on actual well thought out alternative economic systems, yes the theory of an economic system, which is why I stressed so much on the high level archetype being built around economic theory. So we first make sure that the theory is sound, the theory is the alternative theory that we're using is interesting. And we build the world around that theory instead of simply saying, hey, AI will solve this or blockchain will solve this. That's just fantasy really. There's a couple of more questions, you do? Yes, scrolling down. Um, I believe we've uh, talked about frameworks already. Um, the process, is it wrong to say things exist in witness because the community of contributors have a concern? That's actually, that's not wrong. That's not wrong at all. Things exist in witness because a community of contributors have brought in their specific interest to the table and they've brought in their specific domain expertise. And among those domain experts in the process of debate, there is a consensus that emerges on whether a system is sound, whether it should exist or not. And in fact, we've had very nice um, visions that go, hey, AI will solve all of this that have been completely shut down by uh, you know, domain experts who have gone, well, no, that we need to understand why the system is in place. And sometimes so it's it is messy. It is definitely chaotic. And sometimes it's elements in different parts of the world. So someone will show up and say, "Hey, how does death? How is death dealt with in this place?" Um, and then that will be developed and kind of woven into into the building of this world. And so it's not even necessary to have consensus as a point of departure people will put something on the table and it can lie dormant for quite a while until somebody else pops up and is interested in it and then develops it further, which is why it's so important to have a, a kind of a memory um, and, and, and longevity in terms of how, uh, how much time, how much space, the pace at which people contribute. Uh, you know, there is a, an additional question from Vishnu. I don't know if you can see it in the Q&A about the dystopian and yes. utopian scenarios. Uh, the dystopian utopian scenarios to bring out while well being exercises. So this is where we, generally, this is where we repeat the point about this being a chaotic process and the actual framework is bringing in domain expertise and interest to the table. Uh, it would be tempting to say there is a tool or a framework. However, in, in witness in particular, what we, have, what we have gone with is first we flesh out the economy, then we think of the topology because that gives us resource constraints. Then we think about uh, the political history of this area, because now playing off the topology, you can actually imagine what, and these resource constraints, you can imagine what sort of political history comes forth. And from that, you start to imagine notable people. And these are characteristics that allow people to engage with an economy or an economic vision without necessarily, and we have not gone to the level of thinking of what would an art gallery in this world look like. That is a that is sort of say, it's fantastic for imagination, but we have to, you know, limited time, limited energy. So we have to constrain ourselves to this question of what do these economies look like and what would they feel like to live in? But generally this is uh, very domain specific. It depends on what you want to privilege in the exercise of world building. Um, in, I can give many examples from the process of writing, but hypothetically say that like witness is a floating city that's that's one of the conceits is that this is a floating city now if we were to focus on the technology aspects of a floating city 
we would actually not get to economies at all because the te because technologically there are so many problems with this. However, in the interests of examining the impact of these economies next to each other, we had to have a scenario where people have to coexist with each other and resources outside the boundaries of these tightly clustered together economic systems that are present as cities right next to each other districts, resources outside are scarce and people leaving this system, that this is a closed system that people have difficulty leaving. So put it on the middle of the ocean because if you had it in land, people could walk off but on the ocean, there's significantly less chance of people uh, walking off that way. And then we had to think about power infrastructure, and that can be handled with levels of looking at, right, what, what would a power grid in this look like? But in that case, but in, the, in sort of the case of witness, we are more interested in economies than in trying to figure out what frequency exactly uh, are we using for the AC power lines. So that stuff can be hand waved aside. However, if you were interested in that, you would have to switch to. That would be the first type of information that you figure out in the high level prototype and the economy stuff would come later. So it depends on what you want the world to actually explore and express. You have a comment from Terence on the chat. Yeah, so how far will these high level archetypes simply allow earlier cultural influences to reemerge? I have to ask um, is that a crime that earlier cultural influences might reemerge? This, because this depends the quality of what you get and the type of what you see uh, comes that, that really does not derive from etymology, but rather from the people who are sitting at the table and the people who are engaged in this exercise of envisioning a shared world. So hypothetically, were you to bring about several dozen religious communities to the table, then you would see a world emerge that, um, that focuses almost exclusively on religion at the cost of everything else. If you brought a bunch of Silicon Valley startup folks to the table, you would then see the strains of their thinking. If you ensure this balanced representation of the different interests and the different kinds of parties and the different people that you want to bring to the table today in a, in a given society, then you would have a more balanced future. And if earlier cultural influences emerge through that process, then that is because those cultural influences exist today and possibly and potentially if you want to bring them to the table then you have to deal with that as well so this is not about constructing a fantasy future where everybody's happy it's about imagining a plausible system and in fact these strains emerging now for example in sri lanka a strain of uh, very viciously national uh, sort of very popular uh, popularistic very um, pro singhala buddhism is now the woog and it has led to extraordinary tension and division and all manner of race riots. That is something we have to deal with. And that is something that must be allowed to exert its influence on the imagining of this political history to the future, because otherwise you end up simply with a fantasy that ignores, ignores the reality of you eventually having to deal with, with this kind of tension. Uh, on that note, uh, Yoda and both Nadia, maybe I can bring you back to a very UNDP scenario. Um, and maybe you can walk us through how would you use the approach that you use for uh, uh, world building and in witness for some of the issues that we have to deal with. So imagine, for example, that you have, uh, let's say, a government that has produced a manifesto that, uh, you know, uh, well, sometimes is quite fuzzy and uh, vague and then has to turn it into reality or at least help or involve citizens to think through how this might work out in the real world. Or uh, we've seen some statements post COVID about building a new normal, or moving to a different economic paradigm, like for example, embracing the donut economics, etc. So imagine you are one of our colleagues who have to go and talk to government officials or and say, well, you know, why might you want to do this really strange thing of uh, world building and sci-fi to actually engage citizens uh, in uh, exploring alternative policy options or possibilities. 
uh, how might this work? How could you see this working? So, <laughs> so we're starting to get some of these questions already. So the nice thing about having some districts that are already popping up uh, in this world is that you can have a starting point for a discussion saying, which of these, which of these possible worlds uh, and these dynamics feel the most interesting for you or relevant? And you can have a stop, pick that as a point of departure um, and then throw in a scenario and say, okay, yes, we want to make this, uh, this transition to uh, a low carbon economy. And somebody can, you can ask a very specific question, like how would, how would work look like, the livelihoods look like within that district that has that economy or that social uh, system, how would this play out? or a different, a, a completely different one. And in this conversation where you're uh, <laughs> co-creating how this would play out somewhere else, you're also having the discussion in terms of, okay, as a comparison to where you are, um, what does, what does the, you know, would this actually be doable where we are? Yes, no, maybe not, maybe, you know, there are these factors, those guys, they would never accept it. And so it's in the it's in the tension between deploying something in this fictional alternative world and how that would play out in your contemporary setting that you start to find possibly very interesting paths forward. Yeah. And, and so in the case that, of Estonia, oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's to take the low carbon example, it's that iterative process that takes you from world to imagining the lives of people to imagining adverse events and then how the world the systems and the people react to it that forces fuzzy thinking out to sort of take these nice slogans and then actually think about how how does this look like to a person living here and to force a level of clarity on that conversation and on that imagining that then lets you actually present that and argue around that and have more productive conversations instead of like vague nebulous goals. So can I ask you, do you already have um, initiated conversations? I think you mentioned uh, with uh, city municipalities or otherwise, or do you know of others who are already using this um, in terms of an approach to actually either engage citizens or imagine different possibilities. So we have two very different kinds of discussion. I just came out of two calls yesterday. So one is with a uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, um, uh, and they're looking at a um, an island economy. Uh, which is a former former colony that is now thinking, okay, what are we going to do? You know, with our we can't be tourism based; it's too unstable. Um, what what can we do? And they're literally talking about wanting to become a uh, a barefoot Singapore. This was something that was thrown out um, by you know at some political level, and then now everybody's freaking out about how, how are we actually going to do this? So there, the discussion is, OK, let's, let's actually do a festival, like a, a, a local festival, um, put it more in the domain of arts and culture and creativity, and then pull that into the world building and find a container that's going to feel, um, that's going to feel close enough to the people who are participating. In it, right? It's not going to be a document or a lot of texts. It might even be murals, and then the output of that is going to be okay. These these alternatives look really, really interesting. We can look into that. Uh, another discussion we're having is with this network of uh, uh, this network that's looking at how diaspora communities can be involved in humanitarian work 
in their their um, how do you say uh, the uh, the lands of their parents somehow. And there, the interesting discussion is again people who are navigating the complexities of both where they are living um, with the racism or whatever issues that they're facing and wanting to contribute to improving things where, where they are. And there, the discussion is about um, imagining visions that people could be building towards and that uh, shape the strategies they take in pursuing humanitarian work, looking at, okay, um, these are campaigns that we're going to do um, to remove those obstacles towards making that vision a reality. Perfect example is Sudan, which is my, <laughs> my diaspora background. It's like post-revolution. Um, we've seen, we saw during a revolution an explosion of creativity, all of this pent up artistic capacity and this desire to build something anew. And so uh, there, uh, again, we're looking at the, the diaspora kids as builders of these districts and then engaging their respective home communities and fleshing them out and then based on the shape of the districts that they agree on, planning their, their future work uh, on the basis of this. So these are two examples. I don't know if that answers your questions. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Yudo, you were going to add something or? No, my microphone unfortunately okay. has a habit of just All right. I, I think uh, you partially already answered what I wanted to ask, but uh, Obviously, uh, witness is uh, in current form anyway, very heavy uh, relying on text. Uh, but I think the examples that uh, you indicated now, they already point to other direction and form that this could take. I was wondering whether you could uh, maybe tell us other forms you think, you think this can take. Uh, and keep in mind that uh, we may be working with in places where there is, I don't know, internet access, the level of literacy may be low or language may be an issue otherwise. Yeah, I think we have to stress that witness is just one thing and it's one version of what could be. The fact that it is text is an artifact of, again, the people involved in its design, because we communicate bits best over text and over this specific network and platform. It doesn't have to be that, that way, because what we are trying, what sort of this is all geared to is the construction of narratives that are causally linked. And narratives do not have to take the, uh, the form of large wikis or anything of the sort. It is about presenting people with uh, a future of where things could be headed and a series of uh, causal links as to what needs to change and where efforts need to be focused and where discussion really needs to happen to make these kinds of features come about. That does not have to be in text. Mr. Clear. So um, just again to stretch our thinking, uh, you know, so if it's not text, it could be, for example, visuals, it could be other forms completely to imagine, to, to spark well, imagination. One form, that, yep. one form that we're actually experimenting with now are game cards where uh -huh. participants play policy decisions one against the other, where you sort of each district has specific game cards that you can play. For example, if you're in an authoritarian district and you have a very authoritarian government, you have more control over resources. You can move goods around by fiat. And these policy cards are available to you. And the game is centered around what happens when, uh, when a crisis occurs, a specific type of crisis occurs. And the players, or rather the participants in this, select and play different policies to deal with in rounds, to deal with this particular type of event. And the players, uh, players can also trade policies between each other. So the, the, the theoretical reason for this and the reasoning behind this 
is that if you have many districts with different types of policies and people begin trading policies with each other to build this ultimate deck of policies that can take on the most number of adverse events and still have a resilient, the goal is to have a resilient economy still alive at the end of the end of the game. That's the win condition. If you trade policies and you start building this deck of ultimate policies that can deal with stuff, then we can actually examine that and try and understand what combination of policies and what combination of actions need to be enabled for an economy to be resilient, an economy of this type to work out. Fabulous. Yeah, so it could be, oh, ahead, you would look at different, yep. uh, sorry, you could look at um, the same event. So let's say uh, you have swarm of locusts eat, um, eat a big uh, part of the, the agricultural produce. So a district that is, which is wired around uh, a religious or a theocratic order might have fasting as a possible, um, as a possible card to play. Whereas somewhere that is, let's say if it's, a, if it's an island uh, district, it might, might try to look at um, non-land-based agriculture like seaweed or, or whatever, or using the air as, a, as an agricultural space. And so as a player, you could exchange these cards and you could, you could build you know, your, your palette of possible responses and different districts are going to come up with wildly different ideas uh, about how to respond to situations. Super, thank you. And uh, yes, Alberto, well noted. Anything that you harnesses the ability of humans to make credibility checks um, is welcome in this space and any medium is good then. Super, um, so we're coming to close to the hour. Uh, um, I hope that colleagues feel inspired and uh, ready to go and talk to their government counterparts about uh, world building. Uh, we know where to find Yuda and Nadia if you want to follow up with uh, more requests, uh, explore what this might actually look like in practice, how it could work in your context. Uh, we're happy to schedule and put you in touch uh, so that you can talk to them directly or schedule follow-up conversations. Uh, let me thank you both of you very, very much. And uh, I realize I've been a terrible host and forgot to celebrate that Yuda is a, what are you? Yuda Forbes 30 under 30. Yes, one of the top Asians in, uh, under 30 in uh, Asia Pacific. So congratulations. Uh, the next time we will roll the red carpet more uh, properly. Uh, but thank you very much for taking the time all the more uh, after this recognition. And uh, we're very much looking forward to future collaboration. Thank you to all the colleagues who attended. Bye. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you so us. much.